I'm just gonna Hi, Chelsea. <laughs> okay, is everyone ready? Yes. All right. Uh huh. Uh huh. Just let everyone get connected real quick. Looks like we still have some connecting audios. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Um, if everyone could make sure that they are muted for me, um, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Awesome. Hi, I am Kristen Skinner. I'm the executive director here at Laboratory, um, an artist residency located in Spokane, Washington. Since this time last year, we have pivoted to our remote residency model and have now hosted nearly six uh, cohorts of remote residents, which is really exciting because we're actually able to fund artists during this time, which is part of the core of our mission. Uh, this evening, we'll be hearing from two of our current residents, Chelsea Thompto and uh, Sophia Munich, on their projects that they've accomplished during our winter residency. <laughs> and at the end, we'll also hold a Q&A uh, moderated by Lucia Riffle, who is part of the laboratory team as well. Um, and then, oh, second. And I will go ahead and give us about two more minutes. I see more people are still um, asking to join. So I wanna make sure everyone has enough time to hop on. So just bear with me. We will start at 5.07 Pacific Standard Time. Okay, looks like we don't have any more people in the waiting room. So uh, we're gonna go ahead and start with Sophia Munich. Um, Sophia is based in Tacoma and I will go ahead and let them take it from here. Great, thanks Kristen. Um, okay, I am gonna share a presentation because my project is very video heavy. I'll show a few of the videos um, kind of interspersed within my presentation, talk about them a little as well. So let me share my screen and make sure that it works. Uh, cool, okay, so for my project is called I'm Still Here For You and it's what I've been doing for laboratory. It's actually based out of a project I was doing this summer through the city of Tacoma and Metro Parks Tacoma. They had a program called Public Art Reaching Community or PARC and it was a cohort where we took weekly workshops um, talking about how to make public art proposals, how to make a safe, ethical, um, both application and piece. Um, and it also came with a grant stipend that allowed us to create some temporary projects. And it was initially supposed to be temporary installations around parks in Tacoma, but because of COVID, it kind of shifted to all of the workshops being held over Zoom, um, as well as beginning to think about how can you create public art that is COVID safe and that can exist during this time. And for me personally, as most of my practice is interactive textile work. So like touchable, huggable, people heavy interactive stuff. So it was a very big shift for me thinking about how do I create 
create pieces that can exist in that world safely? And also how do I create objects that given how touch can now be a almost like anxiety or stressful thing, like how do I make sure that these objects still evoke comfort and play? Um, so hopefully I'm gonna have us watch one of the videos from my park project. Um, I created three soft sculptures and had friends dance with them and interact with them while responding to um, prompts that I created. So I'll just have us watch it together and then I'll talk about it a little. Um, all right, let's see if I can. Really, can you hear it okay? Just let me know if you can't hear it. Sorry, I'll start it over. I don't think we can hear it, Sophia. <gasps> oh no. Um, should I, I'll just try and turn it up. Is there like a way to share sound that's different than sharing your screen? At the bottom, there should be um, a microphone icon and maybe that's something. Uh, here, I took my headphones out. Is this working? I cannot hear it. Oh no. I'm sorry, what were you saying about the microphone? There's a microphone icon at the bottom of your Zoom window um, to edit audio input and output. That might be part of it. Okay. Also, I wonder if you can open it in YouTube, like in a browser, and maybe that might play the sound. Oh, that's a great idea. Is that working? I still can't hear it personally, no. I think you have to go through Zoom and hi, this is Nora talking. I think you have to go through Zoom and change your audio settings just like you would your, you know, your video settings, how you can choose like webcam or NDI cam or, you know, like you can choose a different camera. I believe you might have different settings in your, in the, under the little microphone icon if you go to advanced settings. Although I confess, I don't know which option that is, but I believe that's where you control it. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I hope that helps. No, 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 no. I, I should have tested this beforehand. This is on me. Um, if you have a tablet <clears throat> or, or even a phone and you wanna play it on your phone and have your regular, like, instead of screen sharing, show it to us on your phone. I know that sounds a little ridiculous and that might not be how you wanna present. Sorry, no. I'll stop talking. But anyway, that would be my last ditch uh, suggestion. Sophia, gonna... if you um, stop and restart your share at the, okay. when you restart the share at the bottom, it will give you an option to share computer sound. See, there's a little checkbox. <gasps> that should do it. Oh my God. Yay, thanks everyone. <laughs> We're all in it together. Thank you. Okay. There is no revolution without love. Is this working? And to really love. Yes. Another, we have to okay. recognize. Okay. I'm going to enlarge my screen and start it over. Thank you all for um helping me. <laughs> okay. There is no revolution without love. 
and to really love one another, we have to recognize the different ways we want to be loved. And it is true, you do have to care for yourself so that you can care for others. I am someone as a Sagittarius sun and Gemini moon and Capricorn rising um, who historically operates in constant motion, whether that's physically or mentally. So it has been really meaningful to be slowed down because what you pay attention to grows. And I feel grateful that this pandemic has facilitated this for me. To be slowed down and to be soft is to be anti-capitalist. We don't need to be productive in the ways that capitalism asks us to be productive. And there are so many ways to do the work that brings us closer to a liberated society. I feel like I've never worked harder in my life despite being laid off from my job. And, and to me, no job under capitalism will motivate me to like as much as I feel motivated right now. Um, not all work is visible and so much begins with our relationships. I'm learning how to better show up in my relationships and learning that truly experiencing that what that looks like depends on the people in those relationships. Um, you know, it requires intention and also a slowness in order to pay attention to the details of what people's needs and preferences and desires are. Plus, I had also been in a place where I hadn't really been doing my my routines that keep me centered and um, what those routines mostly are, are my movement practices or like what it entails. What it includes is my movement practices, which mainly consist of yoga and hooping, um, as in dancing or moving with a plastic circle. And it's just, it's so interesting. I, I love to dance and I, I came into dancing because of my hoop practice. Um, and you know, the hoop is a hard plastic object that revolves around the body. You move with it so as to propel that object's momentum. Um, but this object is a soft six foot noodle. <laughs> and it doesn't ask you to meet it with that understanding of momentum. It doesn't ask anything of you, but it does say I am here for you. And when I finally let myself pick up the object and play, it was so natural. <laughs> I'm here for you can mean so many things, but for me in that moment, when I finally let myself just play with it, um, it was speaking to me. It was like, you left me in the bag, then you put me on the floor and I've observed you for a while and that's okay, but I'm here for you when you're ready. And then it just made sense. I'm so happy that worked. So that was one of three videos from my initial project. And a lot of what I was thinking about was how can I facilitate an experience that is COVID safe, but also like kind of sets you up for the emotional vulnerability to interact with this object. Um, kind of in a larger sense, it really interests me to think about during COVID how our domestic and personal spaces are becoming more and more public through Zoom. And I think this project really directly mimics that. Um, but I really wanted these to be chances for friends just to kind of have almost a collaborative journal-like space to reflect on how their relationship to physical touch has been changing. I know at least for myself, like 
giving and receiving hugs, feeding my friends, really intimate and close proximity events that involve a lot of touch or ways that I show support for people and also care for myself. Um, so kind of trying to use these objects as a tool just to let us talk about what we're experiencing right now in a really open-ended way. Um, and for laboratory, I wanted to do a second iteration of that project. Um, like I said, I did the park videos over the summer, so I actually never really imagined that I would be doing a second round of this uh, project in the sense that I didn't think I would wanna continue to be reflecting on something like I didn't realize we'd still be this far into it to COVID right now. Um, but I feel like some of the main differences with how I've been doing the laboratory project is first of all, the objects are all a little more uniform. Um, and instead of hand embroidering, I'm using a machine embroidery or my embroidery machine to machine embroider the letters and the hearts onto the object. So the objects do look a little different, um, but it's been fun kind of seeing how they can be a new iteration of a project. And this time I've also let myself play with the objects a little bit more. Normally I don't, like I kind of struggle with video because I always fear that if I'm creating video or interacting with the objects myself and showing examples of how to do that, that it's possibly taking away from this really original moment of discovery for the participant. But at the same time, I think that also through giving examples, it can make interacting with the object more accessible. Um, and with a lot of my work, whenever I'm documenting it, if I'm just documenting the object itself, it doesn't really capture the entire essence of the object. So it's been good for me to experiment di with different ways of documentation with human interaction as a part of that. Um, so I've completed two of the three videos. Um, I've mainly been giving them to friends that I know that are comfortable performing or dancing. So the orange object I gave to my friend William and what was interesting with William was that he kind of used um, the object to kind of like put on, like he used it to adapt his own body, but sometimes he would also kind of make it into a friend. Um, but it was just really interesting to see the different ways he used the object. So. I will let the video speak for itself. Oh. I think this time has been an ultimate relationship test. I try to just stay available to others in the way that they need or don't need me. This time period has obviously been tumultuous, not just due to COVID, but socially and politically as well. We're all factoring these events through our own particular lens. It's not my place to challenge that in others, and I've really allowed myself to retreat into my own inner world more. I know a lot of people hate wearing masks and feel disconnected because of them, and I know it's particularly hard for people in the deaf and hard of hearing communities. However, I kind of love them. I like wearing a hat, sunglasses, and a mask. It feels like a disguise or anonymity. I like having a reason to cross the street to avoid strangers. How does this object bring you comfort? It's like a big plush scarf. It reminds me of a boa constrictor. One of the first things I did was wrap it around my neck. I crossed the arms then crossed my own, a nod to my inner contrarian. It bridges the gap, but is also a yardstick of stay away from me. Orange like safety, but also a signal or a warning. It's an embodiment of the phrase made with love. 
I don't have a history with the object, like I would many things I'd consider a comfort object. So it is, in a way, a simulation of comfort, or invites familiarity that doesn't exist yet. It's a little bit like when you meet someone who comes off a little overly nice, and it's a bit disarming without knowing their true intentions, only they are just that nice. It's a bit of an uneasy comfort, or has an edge to it like sleeping to avoid the situation just to wake up and be reminded of it again. It's a plush embrace. I wrap myself in it. I interlace the fingers with my own. I find myself idly caressing my face with it. I've always been somewhat of a solitary person, and I've always vacillated between extremes. I've really tried to adhere to my partner's schedule since he works from home, so I can support him and not be completely untethered or sleeping through the day while he works. But sometimes I'll stay up until 3 or 4 in the morning watching television or working on a jigsaw puzzle, and I get the same feeling I did when I was a teenager up long after my mom and dad went to sleep. My dad always woke up early, so the trick was to avoid detection when he woke up, or else it was awkward and the spell was broken. Now though, as well as then, those late hours can feel like there's still magic in the world. I've always maintained a somewhat idealistic awe of the world and people's potential, and while that remains, I'm less interested in finding or seeing that in others. I'm not sure if that's jaded or just part of growing older. Maybe it's a sign of my own polarization that we're seeing politically and socially. I'd rather save my openness for those I'm close to and worry less about letting others in. I'm more closed off in some ways and more open in others. I think this has been an exhausting time historically, and in a lot of ways, I'm just tired. So I think with what you can see already from watching two is And I mean, I don't want to speak in absolute truths, but I think it's very normal that we're all thinking about both really minute and personal details in our lives, while also thinking about this time in a big picture. Um, And it's been really interesting reflecting on how to give direction that allows people to focus on like specific vulnerable moments in their lives while also having this be an open-ended project that creates space for people to process just what's happening right now in relation to this object. So this is um, my friend, Mary, and actually just- How does this- Fun fact. William, who's dancing with the orange object, and Mary are artist collaborators. So I met them at a residency and they make a lot of performance work together. So it's been, it was fun on a personal note for me to see the way now having had a chance where I've seen them work together and separately and also together with me. So it's been a, this project has been a fun way for me to connect with my friends in a unique way as well. How does this object bring you comfort? Obviously, this object is representational of a physical hug from another human. It has a sort of disembodied symbolism about it that brought out ideas of physical play and touch for me. When I first handled the object, it brought me back to being pregnant and using a bolster or a sort of body pillow to help me sleep on my side. And that's a very comforting memory for me. I take so many baths, almost one per day, and the texture and tactile comfort of your bare skin in warm water is, there's nothing like it. You are almost climbing back into the feeling of being inside your mother's womb. I think there's something to be said for a collective experience, even if that experience is traumatic. I found it interesting how I've softened and even nurtured vulnerability recently. I'm thinking more about being like water 
in observations, interactions, and reactions to others. I feel more empathy. I feel more open. It's helpful for me that I happen to be a parent right now. When you're a parent, you observe just constant presence from your child. He's almost four, so he can only be where he is at any given moment. And honestly, I think that's a noble goal for adults. Just to keep Keep your childlike wonder and accept each moment. It's all we have in life as we move through it, really. I also have prior- prioritized my son's curiosity and nurtured his creativity more since we are at home together more often. He is in constant awe of electricity and home appliances powered by electricity. So we have sort of created an electrical wonderland for him full of cardboard ceiling fans and he's decorated all of his walls and doors with images of outlets and plugs and fans. After he saw me drawing on our walls, I couldn't deny him that artistic outlet. So I really have, with my son's help, focus more on creating a more comforting and inspiring home environment for us to be in at this time. That's Mary. Um, and it was really special to see how she interacted with the object with her son Cosmo. I think that it was really lovely hearing how she could reflect on being both a mother and individual during this time, Um, especially since so much of our lives are now concentrated just at home. Um, I think that's really interesting. And a big part of this project for me as well is having phone conversations with my participants before and after their filming. so it's been it's been really personal and even though each video is like very different um and a little weird like i'm mailing these objects to participants so i'm not in control of the filming process um and as someone that is still pretty new to making film and video art i think it's been a really great way for me to kind of learn as i go um But I would say the biggest difference is with the more recent videos that I've been making is that I've been encouraging participants to describe more of how it feels for them to interact with the object themselves. Like a lot of um, what I ask participants for the prompt is like, how are you providing comfort for yourself, for others? What are some alternatives to physical touch you have in your life right now? But kind of pivoting and finding ways that trying to put language to how they're moving with the object, like what that means to them and how that can kind of be a mirror for our relationship to physical touch in the pandemic. Um, I don't know if you've heard of the term skin hunger, but it's kind of this concept of just craving human interaction and even just being able to like feel another person's skin and a sex toy store that I follow actually published a great short article of alternatives to physical touch if you're feeling skin hunger and they were one of their examples was warm baths or to touch a lot of different textures so like touch cold copper and then touch like a shag rug or just give yourself like chances to stimulate with through texture and touch um, or cuddling with an animal. Um, But that's kind of most of what I wanted to show you all. So thank you so much for watching the videos with me. Like normally people just watch them at home. So it's kind of fun that we all got to watch them together. Um, And thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sophia. That was great.
Really appreciate that. Um, if anyone has any questions for Sophia, if you could just um, hold on to those until the end of our artist talks, uh, we'll have a little Q&A um, closer to the end. Uh, okay, now we're gonna move on to our next resident, uh, Chelsea Pompto, who is based out of San Jose, California. And I will let her take it from here. Hey everyone, thank you for that. I'm gonna share my screen here. All right, and then before I get started, I did wanna drop some links in the chat. So um, my project is very much web-based. And so uh, the links that you see in the chat there are to the live site that I'll be referring to, um, as well as the code and my artist statement, uh, the slides here, and then my general website and uh, other ways to contact me. So, Hi everyone, my name is Chelsea Tomto. Uh, as stated, I currently live in San Jose, California, but I'm actually from the Midwest, uh, Iowa to be uh, exact. And uh, tonight I'm gonna be talking about my work landmarks. Before I get into that, I do wanna talk just a little bit about uh, my work more broadly and uh, how I think about this idea of interaction. So I'm a research-based transdisciplinary artist and my research is situated at the intersection of art trans studies and technology. As an artist, my practice moves across and through materials and technologies and is driven by questions drawn from the embodied experience, working from both my lived experience and academic research. The question at the heart of this research is, in the contemporary gender war, and in particular, its multi-sided transaction through the field of the visual, how do the differently pitched envisionments and enactments impact trans bodies? Furthermore, what role does technology play in creating said envisionments and facilitating said enactments? So really my work exists right at this, this nexus. And so within this framework, I'm particularly interested in interrupting and interrogating the ways trans bodies are violently categorized through technologies and to instead explore how technology might be leveraged in service of trans liberation, as well as the expanding and collapsing of these categories of gender, body, and human more broadly. So I wanna focus in on uh, one idea here, which is this idea of being a research-based transdisciplinary artist and what that means. Uh, so highlighting this idea of trans, uh, the prefix means across, beyond, and through. And for me, what this means in my studio uh, is that trans gets enacted as a gesture, as form, as identity, and as method. So I'm really trying to think about how I can move my ideas, my materials, uh, and my forms across and beyond categories to make new and interesting work. So when I say transdisciplinary, uh, I mean that I work across a lot of media. So this is a, a summary of some of the media that I work with. Uh, while most of my work predominantly exists uh, at the intersection of some sort of digital media, I'm also very interested in physical tactile objects as well. Uh, as far as the methods I use when I'm thinking about my work, uh, fascination is a huge part, and I will actually talk about this uh, a little bit later when we actually go to the live demo. Uh, trans or transing, which is this idea again of moving ideas across and through methods and materials, archiving, creating and manipulating systems, material specificity, layering, and archival research and visual cultural analysis. Uh, the main concepts that I work with are trans studies, and which is an interdisciplinary approach that studies the intersections of sex and gender as related to cultural representation, lived experience, and political movements, and my own experience as a trans person, including being seen as trans and seeing slash experiencing from a trans perspective. And again, systems are a huge part of my work and the body as a political device, trans and posthumanism, and non-human personhood as well. So I'm gonna highlight two projects, uh, previous projects that uh, look at some of the ways that I've been thinking through this idea of interactivity, and then I'll talk about the current work. So a trans material body, uh, which started in 2018 is ongoing, uh, currently still in development. Uh, tra a trans material body explores the boundaries of the self through a poetic appropriation of network technology. The work consists of a mobile network created by a small Linux machine, broadcasting a wireless signal, creating a localized intranet wireless network. This network is battery powered and carried on myself at all times during the performance. 
As such, the network and my body are constantly centered on and overlapping each other. In this work, the prefix trans is a tactic and gesture employed to explore and expand the boundaries of the corporeal self and to reconsider technological prosthesis as a potential site for artistic performance. Basically, what this involves is me wearing the device that you see on the screen here, uh, which is hooked up to my ear and it outputs my heart rate to a live website that's only accessible within about a hundred foot radius of my body at any given time when I'm wearing the piece. Uh, people who have a uh, wireless, let's see if this will actually work, I don't know if it will, um, video won't work, but people who have any sort of Wi-Fi enabled device, whether that be their laptop um, or their phone, if they try to log on to a network that is named Chelsea Tomto, uh, they're met with this splash screen, much like you get when you go to say a coffee shop, uh, which explains the project and prompts them to come and talk to me and engage in a dialogue after which uh, they can be connected to this network that doesn't take them to the broader internet, but rather takes them to just a local network uh, where they can explore this biological data. So this piece simultaneously interrupts people's uh, experience of a very common infrastructure thing uh, that is connecting to Wi-Fi, while also complicating the corporeal limits of my body by saying, if uh, my name is Chelsea, and if this network's name is Chelsea, and if the network is outputting my heart rate, and if it's always centered around me, at what point maybe can we start to think about the network as actually being part of who I am as a person? And so in this work, I'm thinking both about transing in terms of how can we start to reinvent or rethink the ways that uh, we conceptualize the body? And then through interaction, also thinking about what are moments, um, potential moments for poetic interruption in the way that people are thinking about and interacting with technology. So the next piece I'm gonna talk about is Productive Bodies, which is from 2018 to 2019. Productive Bodies explores transgender identity in relation to questions of visualization as violence, technology in relation to the body, and how we conceive of the boundaries of the self. In order to explore more deeply these concepts, uh, I'm looking to another body caught up in similar questions, the river, more specifically the Mississippi, which is actually my virtual background here is a glitched map of the Mississippi River. Uh, the river I grew up next to, the Mississippi, has long been subjected to technologies of seeing and modification in order to make it more productive for militaristic and economic purposes. Using archival maps and audio, found video, and original sound and video, this project draws a viewer into an affective exploration of what it means to inhabit a fluid body subjected to colonial logics of visualization meant to fix, delineate, and stabilize. So this is an installation view of the video portion of this work. Uh, this work consists of both a uh, procedurally generated video piece, a procedurally generated sound piece, a nonlinear artist book, which is both a physical book as well as a, there is a digital web-based prototype of that. Uh, and it also included some uh, curating of archival materials. And so what we see here is a still image of the first installation of both the procedurally generated video and sound. Here is a view of the uh, nonlinear artist book uh, installed with the procedurally generated sound piece, which is on the headphones. Uh, it's a little bit hard to see in these pictures, but basically the idea behind this work was how can I start to think about ways of talking through this arc of technological development and the arc of the medicalization of trans identity in a nonlinear way. So I'm really interested here in nonlinear storytelling. And the way this first came about was I was thinking about what would it mean to make a nonlinear book in physical form? And not just in terms of like a choose your own adventure book where it says turn to page 95 if you wanna go left or turn to page 400 if you wanna go right, but rather what would it mean to uh, truly make the physical structure of a book uh, nonlinear? And to do this, I decided I would start to think about it through video. So um, the video piece that we see here is actually a, a natural outgrowth of this idea of creating a nonlinear book, uh, but to create that in video form. So these videos are procedurally generated and layered over one another in real time, meaning that no matter when you go into the gallery, you're never going to see the exact same thing twice uh, because there is a, a effectively infinite number of variations uh, given the way that I've program the system. And the same can be said for the sound piece. 
So how do we do that with a book? Um, for my part, I was really thinking about, well, um, when I think about a book, I think about the way that we have a cover, a front cover and a back cover. Uh, and I was thinking about the way people physically handle books. And I wanted to challenge that or upset that. And to do that, um, I decided to create a spine of a book that was a point instead of a line. So what we see here in the image is these balls, uh, basically these, these nodes that I created that the pages orbit around uh, rather than a line, which we can think of as the spine of a book. The pages themselves uh, are composed of archival documents that I've redacted and then printed on transparency sheets. Uh, here's an example of what those look like. And then this is a, an example of what the actual um, mechanism that I designed look like. So the uh, pages of the book articulate around this central node uh, and then they attach using these screws. Uh, and so I, I bring this up because it really does get to this, this this uh, idea of interaction and this, the embodied experience of the viewer, which I'm really fascinated by uh, in the current work. Uh, and, and I'm really focused here on what are the potential ways that a more intimate experience like that of a book, or in the case of my website, someone viewing that website at home, what are the ways that as an artist, we can actually capitalize on uh, that space to make uh, a more affective experience. So that takes me to uh, landmarks which, uh, ooh, the dates are wrong. That is actually, I should say, just 2020, because it only started a little bit ago. This is uh, one of the still images from the composition of the website, which I will live demo in a little bit here. Uh, so Landmarks is an exploration of the ways artificial intelligence, and specifically facial recognition, fails to comprehend trans bodies and the threat this failure possesses to trans livelihood as these technologies become increasingly integrated in our daily lives. Landmarks asks us to consider how technology sees us and what happens when it fails to see us for who we really are. So when I'm thinking about this work uh, and I'm thinking about code as a medium, uh, I'm really trying to think about what are the ways that as an artist, I can engage in this material in maybe a different way. So the piece is written in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. The site makes use of the library faceapi.js for in-browser web camera and still image uh, facial recognition. The site itself is under constant construction and revision um, while also being open for viewing and engagement as it grows and takes on new forms, content, and ideas. The intention of this is to invite viewers into the act of coding and to resist a static form, much like the book uh, in my last piece, the Productive Bodies piece in the video, I'm interested in challenging this idea that there is one clear beginning, middle, and end narrative. So any chance I have to uh, keep the, my projects moving and evolving over time uh, are things that I'm really uh, trying to amplify in the work. So this constant revision and evolution can also be understood as performance art through the medium of code. So what might it mean to uh, create an artistic performance um, through this medium, right? And, and for me, that means uh, creating code that people can see. It's sometimes messy, sometimes functions, sometimes doesn't. Uh, so before I get into talking about the actual um, progress of the residency, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the impact that this had. So before the residency started, this idea only existed as a proposal and a few small code experiments. The time and structure offered by a laboratory allowed me to pursue this work uh, in a more focused way, uh, producing beginnings of a website with um, four compositions exploring these issues, uh, which exceeded my expectations in terms of what I was able to actually uh, accomplish in the time given. So uh, I just have a couple images to share uh, from the different weeks of the residency before getting into the live demo of the site. So uh, what we see on the left-hand side is one of those uh, initial sketches, this kind of starting to play with the technology and understand what it can do, uh, which led to the composition of the first page of the site, uh, which starts with this initial question that really spurred this work. Um, as a trans person, is it better to be seen accurately or not seen at all? And especially um, when we're thinking about technology and technologies, the visualization that are supposedly automating the way in which people understand gender. So from there, um, after getting the site up and running and the first uh, page up and operating, 
uh, I began to expand into two other compositions that also dealt with the live webcam facial recognition. Uh, this, what we see on the left, is an early version um, of the composition titled Stages. And what we see on the right is uh, the source code for uh, the composition titled Empire, both of which we'll see here in a few minutes. So weeks, uh, by week, week six and beyond, I started to think about uh, other forms of facial recognition, including still image facial recognition, while also refining um, some of the, the earlier proposals. So what we see on the left again is one of the empire compositions as it had been rewritten. And on the right, it was a little mini performance that I did uh, during one of my live streams where I did a sort of manual version of the facial recognition where I did the, the outline of this still image thinking here um, about this uh, process of facial recognition. Uh, this moved into the final composition, the one that I'm still working on, but was mostly completed as of the end of this last week, uh, which uses still image facial recognition uh, and a series of studio shot photos, which we see on the left of my face, um, as well as more questions. Um, the question that we see on the right, what are they saying to each other, refers to another algorithm uh, that actually generates new images of face faces, which I will talk about here in just a moment. So uh, what I'd like to do now is I'd like to go through and just um, walk through some of the site and some of the work that's there. So when viewers first uh, get to the site, they're, they're, you're prompted with uh, a little disclaimer box that lets you know that the facial recognition is happening. Uh, eventually, I would like to make a version of the site that doesn't use facial recognition at all, but rather uses pre-recorded versions of the facial recognition so that people can have a visual experience uh, of the different techniques that you're gonna see here in a moment without actually uh, engaging in having their own face um, scanned. However, um, it's important to note that the process that I'm using doesn't actually save any data um, and the algorithm is not modified, changed, or improved based on anyone using the software, which to me is a really important part um, of using this software. So I really want to, of course, engage in this work and um, engage in the software, but I want to do it in a way that doesn't just reproduce the same sort of bad things that, that I'm uh, looking at and trying to interrogate. So uh, when viewers first enter the site, this is what you would all see. I'm plagued by a question as a trans person is it better to be seen accurately or not seen at all? How does the algorithm see me? How does it guess what I'm feeling? Is there such a thing as a neutral expression? Can it tell the difference between a smile caused by a joke and one that masks rage? Do I want it to be able to tell the difference? For some reason, it's not wanting to work. Let's see if it will restart. not working there, so we're going to reopen it. <laughs> there we go. So I'll start back here. How does the algorithm see me? And does it guess, and how does it guess what I'm feeling? Is there such a thing as a, a neutral expression? Can it tell the difference between a smile caused by a joke and one that masks rage? Do I want it to be able to tell the difference? To be unknowable to a system may be as liberating as it is dangerous. Moving on to the next composition stages. Here I'm thinking about the way that uh, the algorithm takes in steps uh, a very similar path to other forms of mapping in colonial logic. First starting with discovery, then mapping, then defining, and finally exploitation. So what's happening here um, is over time, we're starting with just the facial detection, which we see at the top, and then the landmark mapping, the analysis of emotion, and the final panel is left intentionally blank 
um, as there, the ways in which these technologies are being used, um, how we might be exploited by these technologies are still in fact unfolding uh, and they unfold in new and different and sometimes horrifying ways every day. Uh, so the reason that this restarts and fades into um, the color that it does is I'm interested in the ways in which these technologies start by assuming or pretending to be about the body, but what they really end up being about is about analysis, right? So it is less about my physical face and being able to see it and more about instead focusing on uh, the way that the computer sees me. And so um, as the image progresses, it, you go from being able to see my face to only being able to see uh, this floating data in a sea of color. And the colors here are defined by the defaults of the software. So I was interested in working with and in some ways against uh, the default way in which uh, the person who originally programmed this library had intended this software to be viewed. So again, each step is less about the body and more about what can be extracted from it. The next composition is Empire, uh, a map of this data body larger than itself. In that empire, the art of cartography attained such perfection that the map of a single province occupied the entirety of a city and the map of the empire, the entirety of a province. In time, those unconscionable maps no longer satisfied and the cartographer's guild struck a map of the empire whose size was that of the empire and which conceded, coincided point for point with it. The following generations who were not so fond of the study of cartography as their forebears had been, saw that the vast map was useless and not without some pitilessness was it that they delivered it up to the inclemencies of sun and winters. In the deserts of the West still today, there are tattered ruins of that map inhabited by animals and beggars. In all the land, there is no other relic of the discipline of geography. Uh, so this is a short story by Jorge Luis Borges from Collected Fictions titled On Exactitude and Science. Uh, and in this work, he's exploring what is the uh, absurdity of the obsession of mapping that extends to um, a map that is the size of the thing that it's mapping, uh, which at the time this was written, which is in the 1940s, that definitely did seem uh, like a rather absurd idea. But um, as we can see with the wireframe, which is responding to my voice now, um, that idea has become reality. And in so many ways, actually, the data that is generated off of our habits, uh, the ways that facial recognition and other technology analyzes our bodies, uh, starts to create a map of us that is in fact uh, larger or at least as large as we are in ourselves. The stakes are different from my body, the body of a trans woman, a body upon which so many claims are being made and remade. Bodies are screens on which we see projected the momentary settlements that emerge from ongoing struggles over beliefs and practices within the academic and medical communities. These struggles play themselves out in arenas far removed from the body. And this is from Sandy Stone and uh, her work, The Empire Strikes Back, a post-transsexual manifesto, which was first published in the late 1990s. So here I'm really interested again in this idea of mapping uh, and also the idea of the landmark, uh, which is how we define um, the face in this case. So uh, the sort of detection that we're seeing here is called facial landmark detection. Uh, and when we think about landmarks, we can think about mapping uh, and we can think about the, the body as being mapped and uh, start to think about the ways in which the politics of regular cartography and mapping of geographies might help us actually understand the way our bodies are being mapped and remapped over and over again. So on to the final composition, the most recent one, machine. Facial landmark rules, brows, five points and four lines each, eyes, six points and six lines each, nose, nine points and eight lines, four points from the bridge of nose to the tip, five points from left to right nostril, 
lips, 20 points and 20 lines, 10 points for upper lip, 10 points for lower lip. For each lip, five points on outer edge, three points on inner edge, corners overlap. Jaw, 17 points and 16 lines, eight per side, ending in the ear. So here we can see uh, the facial recognition um, as it as it analyzes my still the still image of my face. So this is how the, the system labels and maps the features of a face. Under this system, my face is recognized with maximum confidence only of only 89% across nine angles. In one image, the one we see on the bottom left, my face is not recognized at all. In the others, my gender is incorrectly and confidently reported at a high of 95% confidence and a low of 62% confidence. How can I convince this machine of my gender? What might it mean for me to think about uh, how I could perform my gender better for this machine? How can I communicate something that is the sum of so many little moments, gestures, and decisions? The relative lightness of my skin serves to make me more legible to facial recognition software, as studies have shown that these technologies often fail to accurately recognize dark skin faces. Yet, as this technology calibrated to whiteness gazes upon my face, I am still misgendered. In these technologies, uh, as these technologies are finding their way into the hands of law enforcement, I'm left thinking about trans people of color um, and how they're multiply threatened by the intersection of this transphobic and racist tech with transphobic and racist policing. Let's consider another set of faces. None of these faces are real. They're generated by another algorithm, specifically a generative adversarial neural network trained on 70,000 high resolution images and then tasked with creating new faces. So again, all of these above are composites. None of these are actually real people. They are composite images, an assembly of textures, shapes, and colors gathered into formations according to the algorithm's rules for what constitutes a face. So what happens when we point one algorithm at another? If we think back to the rules, browse, five points and four lines each, eyes, six points and six lines each, nose, nine points and eight lines, four points from bridge to tip of nose, five points from left to right nostril, lips, 20 points and 20 lines, 10 points for upper lip, 10 points for lower lip. For each lip, five points on the outer edge and three points on the inner edge. Corners overlap, jaw, 17 points and 16 lines, eight per side ending at the ear. Something that is striking to me about this uh, is first that none of these faces um, are failed to be recognized from one algorithm to the other. Also, we can see that the facial expressions are uh, maximized in their uh, confidence. So one algorithm understands the emotional output of another almost perfectly. Similarly, with the gender, the recognition uh, or confidence of those recognition is predominantly very, very high, uh, with only one image uh, going below 90%. So what are they saying to each other? In their conversation, the composite faces are more legible than my own. They see each other with greater certainty and clarity. They agree on what a face is and place it into specific emotional and gender categories. And this is sort of where the work moves from here, is this idea of thinking about what does it mean and what might we be able to understand by pointing one algorithm at another? And how is it possible that one algorithm generating fake faces can be pointed at another algorithm meant to analyze faces and they understand each other better. And yet my own face is so misrecognized by the same system. Let's see. I'll go here. 
So the last thing that I wanted to talk about uh, was I wanted to go through uh, and just talk a little bit about the code side of this uh, and make sure I pull my slides back up as well. So um, in addition to this live site that we just went through, um, I'm really committed to making all of the code for my work open source, meaning that anyone who has access uh, to the internet and to the live website also has access to the code. Um, so the uh, code and artist statement link that we see above goes here. Uh, and I'm really interested in here in what it might mean for um, there to be a collapse between an artist statement and the actual code. They're both these acts of writing, both in a lot of ways, um, poetic acts of writing. Uh, and so uh, as a viewer, you can both interrogate the site, but then come through uh, and get a guided view of what each page um, entails and development notes about where the piece is going, links to the way that uh, I'm theorizing about this work. And then within each actual piece of code, uh, there's also comments. And so commenting in code is a way to leave notes that aren't viewable on the page. And so there is this sort of interesting dual visuality that happens uh, when you're writing code. So what is seen on the screen, what's seen in the final product versus what's buried and what's hidden. One example of this um, is at the beginning here uh, on the first page after I had stated, I'm plagued by a question, um, I had this phrase when confronted by facial recognition. And I decided I didn't want it in the final piece, but that I didn't want it totally gone either. And so it can exist here as a sort of vestigial uh, piece of writing so that those that want to engage further with the code can start to see timestamps uh, and little scraps of the way in which uh, the code was built um, and what still lingers and what's left behind. All right, so that's all I have. Again, um, the links are uh, both in the chat and on the slide here. And I wanna just take a moment and say thank you so much uh, to Laboratory for hosting me um, and for helping me make this work uh, exist in the world. Thank you. Yay, thank you so much, Chelsea. That was wonderful. Um, okay, um, so we're gonna go ahead and move on to our Q&A that's going to be moderated by Lucia Riffle. And I'm just going to spotlight y'all. Okay, perfect. And if you, um, if the audience does have questions, please feel free to either um, raise your hand so you can unmute yourself or type them in the chat box and Lucia will read them aloud. Okay, I'll give people a minute to type their questions, but to start off, I have a question for Sophia, and that is, um, did you have any expectations for what your participants were going to do with your sculptures when they received them? And if so, like, did they do anything completely unexpected? How did they change based on your initial thoughts? Yeah, that's a good question. I would say um, the main parameters I set for my participants were to film themselves experimenting with how to use the object um, and to try to have their actions kind of reflected in what they're saying and how they're orally responding. Um, but I mean, I didn't really, I set very, very loose parameters. Like I, as I said before, I mainly picked friends that I knew were comfortable performing in front of the camera and kind of left it intentionally open-ended. Um, I'd say William gave me the most surprise with the orange object 
in like a lovably weird way. Um, just because I had no idea he was going to use the object to kind of like anthropomorphize himself. I would say, you know, lighting as well. Like it's completely out of my control, um, like how people are recording themselves. So I think it's given me more information for like how to give direction. All right, that's awesome. Yeah, I liked William's video a lot. That was very cool. <laughs> okay, we have a question in the chat from Avital for Chelsea. Their question is, what would be the correct way for algorithms to recognize trans people? Correct in quotations. Yeah, that's a great question. I think that um, the correct way might be to not try to analyze gender at all. Um, it, that might be that might actually be the end result. But I think that um, you know when I'm thinking about this, I'm really thinking about uh, you know for those folks that identify as non-binary, for example, uh, most of these systems don't even have that coded in as an option, right? And so it might take a complete re-evaluation of what we're trying to do with the technology. Um, that being said, uh, I had a conversation earlier about this idea of like privacy versus recognition, right? And, and, and so as long as these systems are being used, uh, which in some ways we can't help but be subjected to them, how might we make sure that they do a better job at what they're doing? So I think that um, in, in one sense, it's about reducing harm by making sure that, it under, that this idea of gender um, is either removed from these systems altogether or reevaluated to be uh, analyzed in a different way. Um, but in another sense, it might just be pushing to uh, really completely overhaul our understanding of like what, what is it that we can actually understand about anyone's face, right? What can you know about a person based solely on the architecture of their face? Uh, and how, how are there huge assumptions being made about that uh, just by the nature of trying to map the, the quote unquote landmarks of a body? Alrighty, and I'm gonna piggyback on that and ask Chelsea a question. So you use a lot of data in your work and you know a lot of that comes from research and data you collect on yourself, but are you ever interested in collecting data from participants? Like not just letting them see their own data, but actually collecting it? Yeah, it's that's an interesting, um, that, that there's so, there's a lot of uh, really kind of dicey things that come up with with that, which is part of the reason that like the um, that display comes up at the front where it says that like your information isn't being stored, right? Um, one of the ways that I that I would actually like to gather data is another um, step as I move forward with this project is to actually invite people uh, to do the sort of facial recognition um, drawing of, of a, a photograph that they find either digitally or physically and then to submit that. Uh, and I would love to try to create some sort of system that's actually based off of people's own um, kind of probably odd way of mapping a face. Um, so in that way, I am interested in like gathering data, but maybe more data from like a creative or a soft or an almost useless sense, uh, and then trying to make sense of something useless rather than um, kind of like reproducing uh, a data set. And even when I'm using my own um, body in my work, I am still um, always kind of mediated between like, how do I um, engage in this conversation without just making a spectacle of my body? Because media makes a spectacle of trans people's bodies all the time anyway. And so how can I resist that and resist that for the viewer as well? Which is like, I don't think that there's one solid answer, but it's something I'm always thinking about. That's really awesome. I love that. <laughs> Okay, and another question for Sophia. So how are your sculptures living in their new spaces now? Um, are they back with you? Have they stayed with the viewers? And do you see them having more life? Right now I've kind of given them as gifts to the participants. So it's really important that I I'm giving them a stipend um, and paying them for being a part of this project while also um, letting them, 
I don't know, like so many of, of the participants have talked to me about how once they've danced or played around with the like noodles that they almost form a little bit of a relationship with them in their own quirky way. So it feels really nice that like through this project, I can basically like gift my friends a hug in a way that, yeah, they live with them like, uh, my friend Lee and Kyle have a pink noodle and it like stretches perfectly on the back of their couch. Um, Tanya, who you saw in the beginning, whenever they've had like a friend or two over, it's been fun like hearing this participant report back on other people's like first impressions or like trying to engage with them. I have one more participant who is going to be dancing with a purple object and she makes kind of like very dance forward um, sweaters and clothing. So she'll like post herself dancing and her work, like her fashion and her clothing a lot. So I'm really interested to see how she's dancing when it's like not associated with something that she's created. But yeah. Um, I also have a question for Chelsea, if I can butt in. Um, I was wondering, Chelsea, um, I'm trying to think where my sentence starts. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, like, do you feel like at times your work can be a metaphor or like further question kind of the double-edged sort of passing or like how that operates as something that can kind of function as safety but also be oppressive and like do you, do you feel like through your work it's able to give you a better like how, how do you feel like your work is connected to that and do you feel like there's like I don't know it's very I like don't really know how to say this but it's like interesting I wonder how your work I'm very interested in how your work is able to like really dilute like what the visual language of that is and I'm sure you'll be able to say that in a way that's better than me <laughs> Yeah, no, I love that question. I, the passing thing is such like a, it's such a fascinating problem, right? Because like in on one sense, there is actually like privilege that people who are trans who um, can move through the world in a way where they don't explicitly get read as, um, you know, the gender that they don't want to be identified as, right? Like that not everyone is able to move through life that way. So it's I think it's important to like acknowledge that that is real and that there is like, um, even within the trans community, there is big variance between uh, the ways in which different members of our group um, get to move freely throughout society. And even depends on where you live, right? Like what, you know, what's read as feminine in Iowa, where I'm from, versus California, right? Like one, one factor here in California is that as someone who's just over 5'10", I'm remarkably tall in California. And that might stand out and that might make it a little bit harder for me to pass. But when I'm in Dubuque, Iowa, my hometown, there's it, the average height is much higher and you see a lot more women who are 5'10 or above, right? And so even these, even socially in that context, there are different ways that that passing gets uh, meted out. But then when you get to this idea of technology, yeah, it's like, how do I, you know, how can I pass in my daily life, but then fail to pass to an algorithm. And like, what does that mean? And like, do you know how how can I comprehend that? Because when I when I first tell this to some people that like I get misgendered by these machines, especially people who never knew me before I transitioned, they like they, sometimes they're like, I don't understand how that's possible, um, because you know socially they understand um, and and have you know engaged with me as a woman, um, and they're not analyzing, say, my jawline in reference to my brow line and making a, an inference that instead, you know, I was assigned male at birth, right? And so, yeah, I think that this work really does link up to that because it's like all of these things that we do to, to signal our gender 
um, there's so much of that that's nebulous, right? And the ways that people are able to, to figure out how to express themselves and express their genders successfully is very different. Uh, you know, even when I first started transitioning, I didn't understand how, um, you know, I could think about my gender in relation to like, a butch lesbian and how that version of femininity is something that I can actually like, you know, also embody and that my femininity didn't have to be completely in opposition to the masculine identity that I had had before, right? And that even within that spectrum, there's a huge array of different ways that someone can relate, but that a butch uh, woman might also have the same issues I'm having <laughs> with facial recognition software, right? And so, yeah, I think that the, the passing thing is, is so tied up in this. Um, and, it, and it really gets us to start thinking about um, those complexities and the ways that we actually construct gender in our minds. I kind of, I know someone just posted a, another thing, but I kind of have a piggyback question just in the same vein of that. I mean, I already think you, it's really interesting to, yeah, like what you had said of like, what does it mean for an algorithm to perceive you differently than like your physical real world self. Um, and I was wondering if you could kind of continue that question in relation to how your work and algorithms analyze emotion, like how you were speaking about like, like what does it mean for technology to be able to read things that aren't necessarily given to it? And yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that, I think that they're like, they're, those are also linked because like the same, um, basically the way that the system is able to do that um, is that these, the, the data that gets ingested into one of these algorithms is basically a picture of a face that a human being has identified as male or female and as a certain race and then as a certain expression. And so it's like an actual, like very manually labor intensive process, right? And so it all actually boils down to like a person looking at a computer screen and deciding what emotion is on that face, which is like really in the same with the gender, which is like really wild because what that means is that like, you know, you, you do that individually once and you're like, okay, that, you know, no harm in me saying, oh, that person's happy in that picture. But when you do it 70,000 times, uh, you know, it's really, really hard to know what's happening. And, and yeah, so it like, it becomes this thing of like, okay, so I'm smiling, but there are, you know, a million different things that I can transmit with a smile. Um, and then again, it kind of goes back to Alvital's question about like, what's the correct way, right? Like, I don't actually think I want an AI to know when I'm smiling because I'm mad versus smiling because I'm actually happy. Like, that's, that's actually quite more dystopian than it being confused. But that confusion is actually being used right now um, in educational technology. So there are um, prototype technologies being used in K-12 schools that will uh, use facial analysis, uh, webcam analysis like my site uses to determine whether a student is focused or unfocused during class. And then it will signal the teacher to let them know that they're focused or unfocused. But then these, these same systems they don't recognize black people's faces and brown people's faces as well. So already we're, we're at a point where these things don't get to work um, well on everybody. And then on top of that, um, it's automating these responses. So yeah, it's, it, it really gets into a really sticky, troubling situation very quickly. Yeah. Have you read Algorithms of Oppression? It's like the next book on my list. It's, it is on my list as well. I've read um, like a chapter of it. Uh, and there's another, there's a great documentary called Coded Bias, um, which just came out in the fall, I believe. And you can, it's only like special screenings online, but you can find like free screenings. They, they like announce them. Um, and it's a wonderful documentary that like really digs into, especially race and um, facial recognition software in like a really digestible way that's super fascinating. Ooh, that sounds great. Um, okay, so we have a question in the chat for Chelsea from Nora. She says, can you comment on whether your work has given you insight on what it is when we see another being 
or should see as opposed to external factors that might not be accurate and if facial recognition has a useful and ethical function. Yeah, so uh, thanks for that. I, I really like the, you know, staring at this while I'm working on it, because a lot of the time when I'm coding, I have the live uh, facial recognition up on one side and the code up on the other. And like, I find myself um, like looking at my face and then like, holding my face in a certain way to see like what the what the algorithm does uh, and it really does start to like get you to think about like what am i inferring you know in people and especially right now with the fact that we're all wearing masks i'm i find myself like when i'm at a store um so so much of my body language is covered right it's like i as a midwesterner like we smile at people all the time. And like with that, with my like Midwestern smile covered up, I often feel like, wow, am I being perceived as like really aggressive? Um, and so it does really start to make you think about like, um, you know, how, what am I projecting? And then what am I reading from other people? Um, and then in terms of like what facial recognition, if it has a useful or ethical function, I think a useful function um, not that I love Apple, uh, but their technology that uh, allows you to like unlock a device with with your face being used as a fingerprint, right? That doesn't that doesn't actually like imp it doesn't um, assume your gender or anything. It's like literally using it like a fingerprint. I could see something like that. Um, but again, even that kind of that kind of system, you know, it does it work on everybody? Um, what happens if you have something locked down and then you get some sort of scar on your face or some other thing, right? I, I think that there may be um, use cases that that it could be useful, but I think that the underlying idea that we can extract useful information specifically from the visual of a face, especially abstracted through video, digital video and images is like it's flawed from the get-go and then we're trying to do all sorts of toxic things with it so um it, it, it would take me a little convincing to find like a really truly useful and ethical use of the technology i think mm -hmm. yeah just with it um with ai all ai implementation everywhere it's it's so concerning because there is this um almost like a veneer right that that this is an objective point of view, but then as you pointed out, like it's just another human being delivering their own, perhaps not known, not, not consciously known biases, I think is what is what I'm I'm sensing and sort of coming to understand. Yeah, like you don't even necessarily know what those biases are, and then you imp you embed them within the AI and then the AI has this like greater reaching effect on, on people. But so you, so sorry, one follow-up question. Um, are you able to, um, so you're, you're using the facial recognition software that you've pulled, right? And that's like intact. Right? Are you able to alter that code at all or? Yeah, so um, the the code that I'm using, uh, it, there's, it basically has two forms. So one form is that it loads models, uh, and currently I'm using models that uh, were that are publicly available models that actually, you know, are derived from a data set. And then the second part of that is the part of the library that actually does the drawing of the faces, the the rendering the timing. And so all the code based on like the drawing and the rendering and the timing and the position, I wrote all that code uh, and I bring in the models. Um, and so mm -hmm. one of the things I'm interested in doing with this moving forward is to look at other um, platforms, other data sets and, and to see what they do. Uh, one of the reasons I chose this one is because it is, um, it's all web-based. So anyone mm -hmm. here who's on this call can actually use that. Um, which is great in terms of accessibility, but it also means that it's getting used a lot, right? And so it's like, it's a system that is actually currently, you know, being used by other people who aren't just artistically exploring it, but they've made, maybe baked in, built an app that recognizes someone's gender and it's in use somewhere else on the internet right now um, and, and doing it wrong. Um, so yeah, I, one of the next steps too is to, is to really get for like one step further back and look more at the technology that's used to create data sets because I have a vague understanding of how it works, but I would like to get into the nuts and bolts of that 
uh, and really start to dig into how um, how that could be manipulated to maybe make a data set or a model set that like only recognizes trans people and doesn't recognize non-trans people <laughs> as like a you know like an absurdist way of thinking about it. I don't know if that's possible, but it's uh, it's an idea that I've had. Brilliant. I hope you do. Thank you. Thanks. All right. So. Um, still, you know, keep asking your questions in the chat, or if you want to like blurt out some questions, do it. I don't mind if you interrupt me. Um, but one more question for Sophia. So I know you mentioned that um, you have one more sculpture out for participation with someone, but do you have continuing plans for this project? Or if, I mean, if not, if so, do you have other projects in the works right now? Yeah, um, right now I feel like this has been, I don't see myself doing another iteration of this project in the near future. I think a lot of times when something starts to feel kind of systematic for me, I get really bored. Um, so if I were to do like the arm noodle sculptures again, I would love to be able to do it as a collaboration with a choreographer. I thought about maybe adding um, Velcro and like designing clothes that could sort of have them become almost like puzzle pieces. But it's something that I think the next time I do it, it would be interesting to have those objects exist in a non-COVID world. Um, and see what that means. But beyond that right now, I'm making a lot of, um, I kind of have like an ongoing series of like playful creatures that are kind of like gender neutral toys, essentially. Um, thinking a lot about like what, what would like children's toys or objects that would facilitate or invite play look like if like gender wasn't socialized and so ingrained the design of that object, but also just kind of taking this time. I don't know if this is always like obviously reflected in my work, but I'm really interested in like what the function of play is. Like when you think about a mug through product design, you're seeing a handle so you know that you're supposed to hold it or like I make a lot of textile books and through books, like we understand that we flip a page. So how, how can I, I don't know. It's just um, thinking about like what the function of play is. I think also like when we, a lot of times when I think about childhood toys, it's like for giving you like developmental lessons or trying to teach you something. So kind of thinking about like I mean, I think in Mary's video, it was really interesting for me to hear her talk about this sense of play and inner childhoodness or inner childlike wonder from her perspective as a mother, like trying to facilitate childhood wonder for herself and for her child and where that overlaps and where that dissipates. and it really plays into this bigger question I have of like, you know, when we're as adults, how are we understanding who we've grown into? Like when we were children, like, I mean, maybe this is like, this isn't I like kind of a series that I think about for the future. Like, I think it's very tricky to, appropriately talk about like childhood sexuality but like we've all had moments growing up where we like looking back and kind of understand that that was our first time we had been attracted to someone or realized that like we had masturbated for the first time so like I wonder I think I think moving forward I have so many things I want to research um but I'm still making toys so I don't know, I, <laughs> that was a big ramble. <laughs> That's okay, that's really exciting. 
I'm, I'm excited to see where the toys take you. <laughs> Alrighty, and let's see, we're, there's one more question in the chat for Sophia from Jackson and Megan. Um, have you ever learned new things about your friends after seeing them interact with the objects? And has this gift affected your relationship? Yeah, it's like such a fun, I feel like I have learned new things about my friends. I mean, even in the simplest way, like I think working with friends and like having deadlines and thinking about how like collaborating with friends, like in general, that's always like a learning process. Um, but a lot of like Tanya, like I didn't really even know them before this project. I think I like knew them on Instagram and <laughs> was just like, hi, like I need another person. I know you're in Tacoma and <laughs> that you're really good at dancing. So I feel like I really got to know them through this project. And we talked so much on the phone as well. And we're still friends and it's been, um, really wonderful to use this as a way to deepen friendships or even meet new friends. Um, I mean, William and Mary, both of the, the orange object and the turquoise object for laboratory. I had met them both at a one week res residency um, before COVID and then we had done like Zoom karaoke and like talked on Zoom a few times during the pandemic. So like, I I haven't known them for that long and it's been really interesting. Like, like I understand their artwork is like collaborative performances they do together. So it's been really interesting for me to see like their performative personalities as individuals. Um, and it's just interesting to see like what my friends like dive into and are comfortable with and like I don't know it's it has been a really it's been really like really personal and fun it definitely feels like a collaborative thing project that's really awesome I love that all right and one final question for Chelsea so it seems like a lot of your work, you know, keeps growing and evolving even after you may have like finished a project. Um, I guess, do you see landmarks continuing to grow or is it kind of in its interactive state at this point? And do you have any other projects going for the future right now? Yeah, so um, I definitely still see landmarks growing. Um, I think that, you know, the the most exciting projects for me are the ones where as I make something, then like new pieces crop up. Um, and so initially I kind of titled the work Landmarks, but Landmarks is maybe, it's better to say that that's the title of a series than it is the title of a work. Um, because I, I do imagine, and I do have ideas for more compositions for the website. Um, but then I also uh, really see this work as being able to be in a gallery as well. So one of the um, cool parts about making it with this web-based technology is that I can then actually transfer that to say projection um, and live interaction in a gallery in like a really um, easy and streamlined way. Uh, so I would love to be able to make interactive actually physical installations when it's safe to do that again. Um, and then and in addition to that, um, I think that continuing to work with the, the metaphor of like the landmark of the body versus the landmark of like the world and the different that that the way that that like metaphor can be talked about in different kinds of mapping i think that there's a lot of potential there for um more exploration that also leans in maybe more to the ecological side of things which is something i'm always interested in but don't always find uh, great ways to integrate into my work but i'm hopeful that um, i'll be able to do that with this work moving forward that's really great i'm excited excited to see where it goes. Um, that looks like that's all the questions we have for the moment. So I'm going to hand it off to Kristen, but thank you both so much. I love seeing your projects go over, you know, the course of the last couple months. It's been really wonderful. Thank you. Awesome. Great conversation. 
Yay. Yeah, those are great questions, everyone. And it was it was really fascinating to listen to y'all's responses. And uh, I just want to also thank you both. I know that um, doing remote residency is kind of different and new, even still for us. So uh, we appreciate your flexibility and your creativity and your ability to just, you know, come up with these amazing projects and share them with the the world basically in the laboratory community here in Spokane. So thank you both so much. Um, I'm going to paste uh, how you can find Sophia and Chelsea both on their websites and Instagram. Be sure to follow them, follow their work. Um, I'm sure you could always ask them questions via Instagram or email. Um, and yeah, thank you guys so much. Uh, be sure to tune in tomorrow. We're going to have another round of artist talks. Uh, Oh, I'm sorry. I put an I in there, Sophia. <laughs> My bad. I wanted to spell your oh, full name. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, tomorrow evening, uh, 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, we're going to have our last artist talk with uh, Apple Butter Animated. Uh, Megan and Jackson are actually in this room. Hi, guys. And Cal Fish as well. Um, you can find that link in our bio on our Instagram, um, Laboratory Residency. Uh, thank you guys so much, and I hope you all enjoy the rest of your Friday, and we'll see you all soon.